Well, it is three o'clock. And since I want to be cognizant of everybody's time, I think we're going to get started here. Um, I am Tony Gibbons, and I am the Director of Concurrent Enrollment at Utah State University. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm sure more people will be hopping on as we go. Um, sometime in the next couple of minutes, um, Shelly Arnold with our Empowering Teaching Excellence Group uh, Center at Utah State University is going to put a link in the chat if you want to sign up for professional development credit. Cache County uh, School District, Brittany Foster is willing to add your information into the system that will calculate the professional development for you. So we'll put that in there um, a couple of times before we go to the department breakouts in case you're interested in, in uh, professional development credit for attending today. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for another great year of concurrent enrollment. We are so appreciative of all of you and all that you do to help your students and to help them um, prepare for college and earn college credit while they're still in high school. Let me run through the agenda really quickly and then just a few reminders that we have to, um, while we have you all together. We're going to hear from Dr. Matt Sanders today. Um, I will do a little intro for him as soon as we're done with our reminders session. Um, those of you who signed up by, I believe it was the 16th of February, will receive either a hard copy of his book, Becoming a Learner, or um, an e-code for the e-book if you only provided a P.O. box. Um, the publisher wasn't able to send a hard copy to uh, the P.O. box, and so um, he probably will send you a, a code for an e-book. Then um, Shelly's going to take a couple of minutes and share some USU instructor resources with all of you. We'll just kind of, depending on how much time Dr. Sanders takes, we'll let Shelly fill in the gap there. Um, next, we'll have two breakout sessions. You can choose from either Getting Started with Canvas, taught by Elisa Taylor in City. She is awesome, one of their instructional designers, or sharing content and grades between versions of Canvas. Um, that's taught by Neil Legler, who is the director of City. City stands for Center for Innovative Design and, and uh, Innovative Design and Instruction, I think, if I get that right. Um, and lastly, we'll have our department breakouts. And when we get to kind of to that point, I'll let Shelly share how we're going to provide you with that Zoom link for your specific departments. And you'll just um, choose the link that goes with the course prefix that you teach. Uh, just a couple of reminders um, for our teachers of concurrent enrollment. This applies to all teachers, whether you're a high school teacher, high school paid teacher teaching concurrent enrollment, USU paid faculty member teaching concurrent enrollment. Students must register with Utah State for USU credit. Um, I'm, I hate to throw one more thing on your plate, but um, we need you to help us remind the students that they need to register with Utah State on the concurrent enrollment site by the deadlines that are posted there as well. Um, the high school counselors are working with them. Sometimes there's a facilitator in the high school that's trying to help the kids get registered on time, but we really need them to register for credit. Um, likewise, if they choose to drop or withdraw from your class at the high school, they also have to drop or withdraw with Utah State. Um, at the end of every term, we have a handful of students who never bother to register, so they don't get college credit. Um, and they're coming back around a couple years later asking us where their credit was for Music 1010. They forgot to register. Um, or we have students that neglected to drop and they're on your rolls um, and you have to give them a grade. And so that makes it kind of messy for them as well. Because every student has to have a grade at the end of the term if they're still in your class. They can't have a, an incomplete or an NF or something like that. They have to have an actual grade. And we're happy to work with you if you've got students who need extra time to finish coursework. Um, we'll have you put in the final grade. And then if you work with your student a little longer than, the, um, than your term, then you can submit a change of grade. Um, we're happy to work with you if you have any questions about that and just contact our office. Um, that leads into the dreaded topic of using the USU campus system. I know it's not a super popular one, but it is um, instructions that we have received from the Utah System of Higher Education and also the Utah State Board of Education that concurrent enrollment classes, students should be registered and teachers should be using the institution's Canvas platform. Um, it's kind of twofold. Uh, the biggest one is the registration issue. If you are not using that Canvas platform, you don't know who's registered for college credit or not. And that leads to all those issues at the end of the term. Um, 
They also, the USU Canvas platform is a little more robust than the district. Uh, canvases are also, it allows our university to do course assessments on uh, general education courses and other courses. Departments can provide assessments and help to make our classes better for all the students, both concurrent and undergraduate students. Um, so with that in mind, at minimum, if you absolutely cannot use the USU Canvas platform, please at minimum have one required graded assignment in USU Canvas so that you can check registrations and make sure all the kids are registered for, for their college credit. Um, along those lines, deadlines for final grades at the end of each term, grades are due within four days of the last day of class. And it has to be a letter grade. Um, that's the university's policy. And so we ask that, that you align with that as best you can. We'll try to remind you from our office and help you um, to know if you've missed one. Um, but we have to have everything in by the end of the term for state reporting, um, for concurrent enrollment reporting that affects your district um, as well as the university. So please um, do that as best you can. Um, also, if you will remind your students to complete the idea surveys. Um, there is some important information that we can glean from these course assessments, and you can tailor those um, to what you need in your class. Um, you, those are sent out close to the end of the term by Utah State to all the students in your class. And before that, that survey is sent out to the students, instructors are notified and you are asked if you'd like to pick any essential elements to be included in the survey. Um, this allows you to take off questions for students' progress in math concepts, for example, if you're teaching a humanities course. You also are able to add your own questions to the idea survey if you want specific feedback from your students on the course. But these are assessments that um, the university requires. And so we really ask you to remind your students to complete those idea surveys. Um, and they'll keep getting reminders. Of course, it will go to their A number at USU email address, but we would appreciate any help you can give us with that. And I think we're also going to um, provide an opportunity for some idea survey training. If anyone is interested in that, we'll send out a survey after this conference and just ask for some feedback. If there's things you'd like to learn about um, a little bit more uh, in future conferences or any additional trainings that we can offer for you guys, that would be great. Um, finally, thank you, thank you, thank you. We so appreciate you and all that you do um, to support your students and to support concurrent enrollment. Um, and we are really, really appreciative of you. Um, I would like to turn the time over to um, Dr. Sanders. Good, we gave him some extra time. I was going to read a little bio. I told him I would make up something, but um, Dr. Sanders, Matt Sanders is a professor, professor of communication studies at Utah State University. And he holds a PhD in communication from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Matt conducts research in the areas of nonprofit organizations, organizational communication, and student learning. He's the author of Becoming a Learner, Realizing the Opportunity of Education, which is used in first-year experience courses at many colleges and universities, and definitely here at Utah State University. He is also the co-author with John McClellan of Studying Communication, An Invitation to Purposeful Learning, Awards recognizing Matt's work with students include Distinguished Teacher Award from the Western States Communication Association and being named Teacher of the Year for the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Utah State University. And really, he actually is just an all-around awesome guy. So I'm grateful that Matt is willing to take some time to teach us today about becoming a learner through the lens of concurrent enrollment. And we'll let you take it away, Matt. Thanks, Tony. That would have been more interesting if you had just made some stuff up, but uh, that's okay. I'm glad to be here uh, with you today to just talk through how we can think about helping our students in concurrent enrollment. It, this is part of a big project that I've been involved with under the leadership of uh, Heidi Kessler and Lisa Simmons and Harrison Kleiner here at the university, thinking carefully about how we're going to help students thrive in college and how we can help them stay, how, how we can help them be retained. And we lose a lot of students here one to year two, almost uh, somewhere between like 24 and 30% we lose from year one to year two. And that's a lot of students who are starting and, and not continuing. And we need to address that problem. And 
and help them at their beginning stages to figure out why they're here and how they can understand the system. So my work has just been centered around how we can help engage students in conversations that will allow them to take the best advantage of the opportunity that they have here. So I know Zoom isn't super interactive, but I'm wondering if I could just ask all of you to drop a few things in the chat uh, regarding this question. And you can just put these in simple phrases, but what are students' complaints and frustrations and concerns about the current enrollment classes they take um, and general education overall? Um, if you would just drop some of the things that you experience, what are they concerned about? What are their complaints? What do they not understand about general education? Got a couple of votes for time management. It's gonna be hard. Yeah, the expectations of what it's gonna be in college. Yeah, lo lots of homework. My kids were that way. Levels of expectations. Yeah, more management. They don't think it applies. Um, they want to get an A for as little work as possible. I mean, this is, yeah, the difficulty of the assignments. Um, they don't understand the gen ed process. Boy, there's just a lot of these things that you experience every day as you have these students come into your classes. They're excited about college. They're starting it early in high school. And and then we're, we're trying to think about, um, okay, well, what do we do here? How do I help them work through these kinds of questions? So I want to just help you th think about this in some interesting ways that have really been useful here at, at Utah State for us. As we've focused in on this big question of how do we frame the purpose of a college education? This is important for every student who gets into a concurrent enrollment class who comes to USU and starts, we need to make sure that we're framing the purpose of a college education up front. This question is, is especially important for students who um, are first generation college students who come from, uh, who are underprepared or who have other risk factors that make them more likely to um, not complete college. They're the ones that struggle most with how do I explain why I'm doing what I'm doing? And so what we've done in our introductory course at, at USU in our connections class is to frame the whole introductory experience around why am I here and what is this place instead of just all of the what's and how's. What we also understand is that they're spending time almost every every one of them in a concurrent enrollment class. And that's where, in many ways, they're getting their first introduction to the university. And so I want to invite you to consider these ideas with me and, and invite you to think about ways that you could include them in your classes. Tom's I think it'll have an outsized here. impact on students and their ability to uh, succeed. <clears throat> and so as I asked you to put those students' complaints and questions like, when students offer questions and complaints, you know this is, as experienced teachers, they have some plea for meaning. There's something that they don't understand or they don't get. And that is especially true with general education. Why do I have to take gen ed? Why are they so similar to the high school classes? When am I ever gonna use this, right? So when we think about a student complaint as a plea for meaning, then what we need to think about is, okay, well, how do I start my class in a way that that decreases the, their uncertainty about these kinds of things. And a lot of these questions come because of the mission mismatch that happens between what students think about the university and what the university does. Students are thinking about, you know, what can I do? They think a major equals a job, which equals success. They think about college as job training. What are you gonna do with that degree? What job am I gonna get? These aren't bad questions, but these questions are mismatched to the university's mission of it's interested in who you become, the value of a whole degree, a broad liberal education on top of a major field of study, and even in very vocational fields of study, still broad learning. And the purpose of college is to produce educated persons who thrive in their, in their family circumstances, in their communities, and in their work. 
So what we have is students coming into the university who have an expectation of what it should be. And that expectation is misaligned with what the university is actually doing. And then we have students feeling really frustrated at the university for fulfilling its mission. And not just our Utah State University specific mission, but for the state of Utah's man mandated curriculum through all of the governing documents that the Utah system of higher education operates under. And so again, when they're coming into your general education class, they may have very little understanding of, of how this works. So the way that I've framed this over the years that's been really helpful for me and, and for the people that I've helped uh, think through these questions and train is that without a compelling why, the what's in the house don't really matter. So if you look at this chart here, a lot of the times what we're doing is we're trying to get better outcomes. We want students to, to study harder, to get better grades, to be more college prepared, to do all the things that would give them the outcomes that we want. And then, so we want these outcomes and we focus on behaviors. So we teach them about study skills and we teach them about um, taking good care of themselves. And we, we create all these things to help change their behaviors. But what happens is students hold a lot of beliefs about the university that aren't helpful for them. And they believe that gen ed is a waste of time where it's just a hoop and a hurdle to get through or that maybe college doesn't have enough value and that influences how they see themselves as learners the attitudes they take up and then if they're if the way they see if the whole why of the university is out of alignment with its mission then whatever we do in teaching behaviors is not going to get us to the outcomes we want because they're just not thinking about it in that way so I'll just tell a quick story. I had a student in a, this was like a junior level class. So this was the first semester of his junior year of college and a great student. And that was before I wrote the Becoming Learner book. And I just had, uh, I had a class discussion about it. And I did it at the beginning of every class. I still do it at the beginning of every class I teach. We talked about it. And, and this was a student that you would never think was at risk of not continuing in college. Sat on the front row, asked questions, talked to his peers, you know, seemed engaged. And I got an email from him at the end of the semester thanking me and then saying, this was going to be my last semester. I was going to drop out. I just finished all my general education, just starting in my major. I had no idea why I had to do all that stuff. It was taking so much time and so much money. And I was ready to quit and move back to Salt Lake and be a personal trainer. But after our conversations in this class, I'm going to stick it out. I see the value of that. And it was so much fun to watch him take off after that point because he had been doing all of this work and no one had told him why it matters. And then it just ends up being like, eat your vegetables because they're better warm than cold, right? It's just good for you. And they don't ever get a sense. And all I did was spend 75 minutes in one class session talking to my students about the why of the university, the purpose of becoming a learner. What I did with him, and I didn't make anything new, I just told an old story in a new way. I helped him alter his beliefs about the value of a university education and why he was taking his courses. His attitude changed, he engaged better in the behaviors, and his outcomes were terrific, graduated, moved on. There are a lot of students in your classes, and they're not quite sure about college. They don't know if they really want to do it. They don't know if they if they see value in it or not. They might not believe that they're up to it academically or personally. And if we can help them see the importance of an education and the importance of becoming a learner, I think we can infuse a bunch of excitement and energy in them and give them the self-efficacy to continue. And if we can do that early on, we can have a huge and an outsized impact on their success over time, which to me is just one of the best reasons to be an educator, to just spend time with these students and to help them see the value of what they're doing and help them to grow and to thrive and to flourish. So that's the project. So this is the book that hopefully um, all of you have received or will receive soon. This is a QR code if you want to sign up for more copies if you want to share them with other people. But I wrote this book early on as a professor. The idea actually came to me as a as an, a finishing my undergraduate degree where I, I got done and I just had this 
moment of realization of that's why I was here. Because you realize when you graduate from college that you're the least experienced and least qualified person for every job you're applying to because you're brand, <laughs> you're brand new. And so the thesis of this project is simply the primary purpose of college isn't to just learn a professional set of skills, but it's to become a learner. Your job is here is to learn how to learn and unlearn and relearn. And there's a really important space in here for general education because 21st century job skills are general education outcomes. The careful thinking, the understanding and dealing with difference, communicating in written and in, in spoken form, um, all of these kinds of things. The technical skills are, are important, but they're only important for a minute. And then, and then they change over time. And so when students talk about- Sorry, this, go ahead. When students talk about this with me, it's been really gratifying as they, as they go through the book. And, and the biggest, there's a couple of pieces of feedback that come to me. And, and one is, why hasn't anybody told me this yet? Because they feel some relief about it and they're excited. Or they'll tell me, oh, this is what my- English teacher told me, or this is what my mom told me, or this is what my grandpa told me. And now it's true because a stranger wrote it in a book. Um, but they, they're grateful for the message. They're wondering why it hasn't been given sooner. Another general piece of feedback that comes when students engage in this conversation is, wait a minute, like I wanna be a doctor and you're telling me that just it's just important to learn and I've got all these other things to do. But they want to engage in this question. And when I've been at different institutions, um, you know, around the West and around the country, and I've talked to their students, there's just students are really, really hungry for meaning. As my colleague Harrison Kleiner here at Utah State often says, they kind of want to, they want a Hogwarts experience. They want this to be transformative. But when you start into your education, you're thinking, okay, I got to take English 1010, English 2010, and, and chemistry 1010. I, there's not a lot of meaning in sort of the, this, this, the distribution model of general education without some framing around it. So I just want to show you a way that I talk to students about this and that, we, that I've introduced students to. This is part of it. It's written in the end of the book as well. But I want you to just think about this from this perspective of how I would share it with students and encourage you to think about how you would have that same conversation with your own students. So when I was in a sophomore in college, I had a professor that really just dinged my way of thinking when he shared this with us. He said, the hardest thing to know is the thing you think you already know. The things that are so familiar with us are the hardest things to understand because they're so familiar that we don't question them or think about them anymore. And certainly for students, education and learning is that. And you go from high school and then you do concurrent in high school and you're in that same space. You've been doing it forever. It feels like the same thing. And I asked students to think with me for a minute about what it means to look at education anew. And how could we look at it anew in a way that will help us realize the opportunity that's in front of us? And that was a really important experience for me. Why questions. So when your students ask why questions, why do I have to take this? Why does this matter? You know, why, why should I need this in the future? Whatever their questions are, the asking why questions are important. And I always tell the students, at any point, please ask me why or so what? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to take all of these things? Because why questions indicate to us that they lack some meaning that they really need. And again, I, I can't reiterate enough the importance that this is for first generation students and students who, who lack, and or students who lack confidence in their abilities. When they ask a why question, they need some meaning. And I think the story is pretty, pretty simple. So these are the two big questions that I get most often. If I just summarize them, why do I have to take classes and things that I'm not interested in? And why do I have to take classes that I won't use in my future job? These are almost always directly pointed at general education. I did this in high school. Why am I doing it again? And these are really good questions. These are really good questions. But if you just take up what's talked about in the news about higher education, um, you're not going to get answers that are satisfying. And you're going to get answers that are going to try to push you out of the university. And since higher education 
is the number one predictor of intergenerational socioeconomic well-being. We want as many students who want to be here to stay. We don't want them to leave simply because they don't see the point in what they're doing. And we can help them do that. So these are good questions. Students should ask these questions. We just want to make sure we give them the kind of uh, answers that, that they need. So I want to help you think about this through some learning that I did with our student athletes a number of years ago. I was asked to come and talk about the Becoming Learner book and how that might apply. Um, and I thought that would be a great opportunity um, to test out this idea of the hardest thing to know is the thing you think you already know. And I thought it was great because I'm an athlete myself. So here's me at the pinnacle of my athletic career. I think this is like 1988 or 1989. And I was a budding John Stockton. You can see my nice John Stockton shorts there. And I was, I was ready to go for it. And I love playing basketball. But this was the peak of my abilities. And um, my experience playing sports was uh, you pay your 30 bucks with the city. And then you go to, um, to the games. And everyone plays. And you get a treat afterwards. And trophies all around. And like that was it. And so here I am with all these division one student athletes they are on scholarships. They've been working cra like crazy. And I was like, okay, they have a different experience than me. I'm going to test this idea out. And so um, I asked them this question, like, why do you have to do so much exercise and training? Like, why can't you all just like have a trophy at the end of the season and, and just have a scrimmage on Wednesday and play on Saturday? Like, why do you have to do so much exercise and training. What's the point of all of these things? Because I don't see the connection. Um, and again, I asked them that question to see if they could tell me if they knew why they were doing those things. And I asked them some specific questions because I went to the gym once when I was in college, so I knew all about it. So I asked them about ex specific exercises like the squat, right? You put this bar on your shoulder and you go up and down. It's super duper painful. After I did this for the first time, I lived on the third floor of an apartment and I lived at the bottom of the hill of a hill that was like old Maine and it hurt every step up and every step down. And I've never seen anybody do this on a field of competition. This is not like, you know, the go-to move of LeBron James or Steph Curry or, or Patrick Mahomes. Nobody does this. And I was like, why do you do this exercise? It seems pointless. And they were like, well, this guy in the offensive line was like, look, I got to make space for the quarterback and open up space for the run. My thighs are my biggest muscle and muscle group in the body. I do squats so that I can have really strong legs. I was like, all right. And the volleyball players are talking about the need to jump. I mean, you can see how high this, uh, this volleyball player is. Um, basketball players, similar things. The track, you know, legs and lungs. That's all it is. The kicking a soccer ball, burst of speed. They have these really good answers of, okay, this is why we do the squat. I was like, okay, well, let's look at some other exercise, like the bench press, which is kind of like laying under a guillotine. If you've ever been in a gym where somebody didn't have a spotter and the bars on their neck and they can't breathe, I mean, why would you do this exercise? It causes a ton of pain and discomfort across your chest, chest and soldiers, shoulders, and no one does this. And, uh, and again, I got these great answers and the softball players are talking about strong shoulders and chest muscles to throw a ball at high speed and swing a bat. And the volleyball players are talking about the need for strong arms and the, the linemen are talking about the, the that battle for space is also an upper body battle and, and throwing and shooting and gymnasts holding their whole body up on their arms and shoulders. Again, this quick set of answers. Then I asked them about running because this is not my favorite thing to do is to run nowhere uh, or run anywhere. And, and I'm asking this and I asked about certain sports. I was like, okay, volleyball players, why would you run? Because this is not a running game. Volleyball is what you play in the backyard or on the beach and you hit the ball and you, you know, you just move around. Don't say that to volleyball players. They don't, they don't like that. They they took it in good humor, right? Like softball bases are 90 feet apart. A basketball court's 120 feet long. Like I asked the, the linemen on the football team, like, why would nobody runs? Like you don't run, you knock each other over and you move. And if you pick up a fumble and run for a touchdown you're on ESPN top 10 and it's not because you picked up a fumble or scored a touchdown. It's because you were running because you just don't run. And um, boy, they just had some great automatic answers here. And they're like, look, if we want to celebrate and win, if we want to be the ones holding up the championship banner, we have to play harder at the end of a game than a beginning. We need an incredible amount of endurance. And so you might not think that volleyball players do a lot of running, but we're in a ton of endurance with our lungs and running gets us there. 
And I just thought these were brilliant answers. And I want to point out that their answers were not, um, they didn't stare at me and scratch their heads. They didn't have silly answers like, well, I don't know, that's what my mom did when she played ball, so I did the same things. They had very specific answers for why that certain exercise played into their ability to do the things they cared about the most in their sport. So then what's the overall answer then to this question? Why do you do so much exercise and training? Well, the answer is so they can thrive and flourish on the field of competition because they know that no matter they're going to make tens of thousands of physical and mental decisions, all kinds of opposition and changes. Um, sorry, I'm losing my stuff here. They know they're going to confront all kinds of things and they need a mind and a body that's capable of doing whatever comes in front of them. And so they do all these exercises and all these conditioning and all the things that they do so that they can do that on the field of competition. So let's move this back to general education and concurrent enrollment. Why do students have to take classes in so many different subjects? Why do they have to take classes that may not apply directly to a future job? It's because we're not just concerned with their first job, which will be the lowest paying and least interesting job in their life. Like we're interested in getting them to that point, but we're interested in developing the intellectual habits of mind that they can take with them for the job they get when they're 45. And so the answer for the, the student is the same as the athlete. Like they're here to learn how to thrive and flourish as a human being, to learn how to learn. And so when students are doing math in concurrent enrollment, can you help them see the portable intellectual abilities that they're developing in that class that can help them think quantitatively and analytically and how that plays out in the future? When they're reading books in English and they're writing, can you help them see the portable intellectual abilities that come in science and creative arts and humanities and all of the courses? Students want this and they like this this framing because it really helps them see value in what they're doing. It's not just the content which will fade away, but the but learning how to learn and developing good intellectual habits of mind allow them to move forward. And that is just such a meaningful way for students to think about it. And it doesn't take a lot of time at all. So my invitation to you is can you spend the first day or two in each of your classes talking about the why of college, both the overall college endeavor and the why of the course that they're taking, how it fits into the overall curriculum and the abilities, intellectual abilities that it's developing in them and answer their questions and the things that they're frustrated about. I think that's really important. So whether, I mean, you can have a discussion, you can find news articles, you can use becoming a learner, you can get a, a, a classroom set and have them read it. Some concurrent enrollment instructors do that and say, this is the book that you're going to have at USU when you start. But do something in that first day or two to engage them in this question. And then you'll have an outsized impact on the students that have the least amount of confidence um, or who are first generation students where this narrative of, of habits of mind and learning how to learn isn't available to them as readily as it is to someone whose parents and grandparents went to college. Their questions are important and their questions are, are legitimate and Janet isn't framed very well and it can just feel like they're knocking a bunch of stuff out. But if you can help someone build the confidence in themselves as a learner and help them to keep moving forward in college, the, the impact in their lives and the intergener intergenerational generational impact is huge. But my experience is we don't have to spend weeks and weeks doing this. We just frame it in a day, read something, discuss, have a response, see what they think, and then just keep looping this back in your class and reminding them of this. And I just think about students coming to USU with three or four or five concurrent enrollment classes and some more. What if you had that in every class? If every class had that, they got this in their English 1010 and 2010 in high school. They got it in their, their math 1050. They got it in biology. They got it in humanities. They got it in creative arts. They got it in their social science class. When they came to the university, they would be much more prepared for the intellectual endeavor that they have. 
and they would see more value in the concurrent enrollment experience rather than just let's do it quicker and sooner. Quicker and sooner is great, but we want them to engage in that. So that's my invitation to you. Um, if you have any questions or if you wanna any individual feedback about how you can use becoming a learner or other kinds of things in the class, but there is a, there is a great need for this with our students and it's a great joy to teach in that way. So thanks for giving me some time this afternoon and I hope you have a great workshop and, and if you need anything, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, you're awesome. We had a couple of questions in the chat about yeah. getting copies of your book for the classroom. Um, is that a possibility or is that too big of an ask for your publisher? Maybe it's an offline question, but. Um, I don't think the publisher will send, you know, huge stacks to, to classes, um, but the, the book is uh, pretty inexpensive as as a book and so okay. if you if you can go to your uh administration and see if you can with your with your uh money to buy books for the students because i know there's lots of classroom awesome. sets but uh it looks like someone suggested a using a school district concurrent enrollment budget so teachers maybe take that back to your administration like matt said or to your school district because that would be excellent it's not a very big yeah, book. I know that it's good yeah and it's short the book is literally it's like 60 pages it's it and people told me to write it really long and complicated and i just said that's not what an 18 year old needs and the beauty of the book is that you can you start a conversation with it you know your students you know their needs you know their challenges you know their struggles so you get them they get something to read it frames the conversation you discuss it with them and then you will be the spark that makes it work uh, it, it's designed to start the conversation. So yeah, good luck and thanks a bunch. I appreciate it.